It was July 17, 1994, a summer night in Lexington, Kentucky. The house at 570 Woodland Avenue was alive with the energy of a college party. Trent DiGiuro, a 21-year-old football player at the University of Kentucky, was hosting a celebration in honor of his upcoming birthday. Friends came and went, spilling onto the porch, sharing drinks, and enjoying the easy camaraderie of young adulthood. Trent was sitting in his favorite leather recliner, laughing and chatting with his friends in the living room. Shortly before midnight, without warning, a single, deafening crack rang out. For a moment, no one understood what had happened. Conversations faltered, replaced by confusion. Some thought it was fireworks, others perhaps a car backfiring in the distance. Then, as the seconds passed, the horrible truth began to take shape. Trent, still in his chair, wasn't moving. His friends rushed to him, their excitement turning to panic. Blood had begun pooling around his head. One of his friends shook him, calling his name, but Trent didn't respond. Someone else spotted the wound, a clean, precise bullet hole at the base of his skull. Someone had just murdered Trent, and none of them had seen it happen. Outside, the warm Kentucky night remained quiet. Police arrived shortly after a frantic 911 call. It was clear from the outset that this wasn't a random act of violence. The shot that killed Trent came from a high-powered rifle, fired with incredible precision from a distance. Investigators quickly identified the shooter's likely position, a darkened area near a dogwood tree about 200 feet away. This was cold, calculated murder, executed with a level of planning and accuracy that suggested the killer had a personal vendetta. The friends who had been with Trent were as stunned as they were grief-stricken. None of them had seen anyone, and there was no clear reason why anyone would target Trent. He wasn't involved in drugs, didn't have enemies, and wasn't the type to pick fights. As far as anyone knew, he was a popular, hard-working student athlete with a bright future ahead of him. The investigation quickly ran into roadblocks. With no witnesses and no obvious suspects, investigators were left to speculate. Maybe it was a jealous lover, they thought, someone upset over a relationship Trent was rumored to have been in. Another theory assumed that, as a football player, Trent might have crossed someone in the gym scene. There was even a tip about a mentally unstable man who had taken an unusual interest in the case, but nothing ever came of it. Leads dried up almost as quickly as they emerged, and soon, the case stalled entirely. By the time the case passed its fifth anniversary, it had gone completely cold. Detectives could only admit what everyone feared. Without new information, Trent DiGiuro's killer might never be found. Trent's parents, however, refused to give up. His father, Mike DiGiuro, clung to the belief that someone out there knew the truth and that someday, somehow, they would come forward. Little did he know, that moment was closer than anyone expected. In January 2000, a phone call to Detective Don Evans would change everything. The call came from an attorney representing a woman named Amy Lloyd, who claimed she knew exactly who killed Trent. According to Lloyd, her ex-boyfriend Shane Ragland had once made a shocking admission, I killed Trent DiGiuro. Detectives immediately took Lloyd's statement. She recounted how, during their relationship, Shane told her about his anger at being blackballed from Sigma Alpha Epsilon, one of the fraternities at the University of Kentucky. He blamed Trent DiGiuro for ruining his chance to join, saying that Trent had reported him for something inappropriate during pledging, leading to his rejection. Shane's wounded pride festered for years until, one day, he decided to act on his grudge. Amy described how he told her in chilling detail that he had spotted Trent sitting outside that night, retrieved his .243 caliber rifle, taken up position under a tree, and fired the shot that ended Trent's life. The investigators wasted no time verifying her story. They dug into old fraternity records, and there it was. Shane Ragland had indeed been blackballed from SAE, and Trent had been part of the decision-making process. Even more damning, another fraternity brother, Matt Blanford, remembered an incident years earlier when Shane had confronted Trent at a party, accusing him of ruining his life. According to Blanford, Trent didn't deny it. He simply shrugged and admitted, Yeah, I did. With this explosive new evidence, police obtained search warrants for properties owned by Shane's family. 
They discovered ammunition consistent with the bullet that killed Trent, but the real breakthrough was a .243 Weatherby rifle found at one of the homes. Forensic experts would later confirm that this type of rifle was consistent with the murder weapon. Despite the growing pile of circumstantial evidence, police needed more to build an airtight case. That's when they turned back to Amy Lloyd. They asked her to wear a wire and confront Shane, hoping he would incriminate himself. In a tense meeting with her ex-boyfriend, she managed to steer the conversation toward Trent's murder. Shane didn't explicitly confess again, but he made several cryptic statements that hinted at his involvement. When she pressed him about feeling guilty, he admitted to regretting some of his past actions but stopped short of outright admitting to the crime. Still, the recordings, combined with Amy's testimony, gave prosecutors enough confidence to move forward. By the time the case went to trial in 2002, prosecutors had assembled a compelling narrative. They argued that Shane Ragland, a man from a wealthy and well-connected family, had harbored a petty grudge for years and turned it into a deadly vendetta. They detailed how he had methodically planned the murder, using a high-powered rifle to snipe Trent from a concealed location. Amy Lloyd was the star witness, recounting Shane's confession and his obsessive hatred toward Trent. Her testimony, coupled with the evidence found during the searches, painted a damning picture. Shane's defense team, led by high-profile attorneys, pushed back hard. They attacked Amy's credibility, portraying her as a vengeful ex-girlfriend eager to frame her former lover. They also challenged the forensic evidence, claiming it was insufficient to link Shane directly to the crime. However, the jury was unconvinced. After deliberating, they found Shane Ragland guilty of murder, and he was sentenced to 30 years in prison. It felt like justice had finally been served, but the courtroom victory was short-lived. Years later, Shane's conviction would be overturned on appeal. The Kentucky Supreme Court ruled that the prosecution's reliance on the FBI's bullet analysis was problematic, citing issues with the scientific method used in their conclusions. The FBI's method of bullet-lead analysis had been discredited nationally, casting doubt on its validity in any case, let alone one as consequential as this. In 2006, after spending six years in prison, Shane was released, his conviction erased. However, freedom didn't come without strings. Facing the possibility of a new trial, he took a plea deal, admitting to second-degree manslaughter. This admission, while legally a guilty plea, came with no additional prison time. Shane walked out of court a free man, immediately retracting his statement and denying any involvement in Trent's death. For Trent's family, the legal system had failed once again. A father's pain and frustration boiled over, and Mike DiGiuro bluntly declared that wealth and privilege had bought Shane Ragland his freedom. He wasn't about to let the matter rest. In 2008, the DiGiuros filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Ragland, seeking not just accountability but a measure of punishment. Ragland didn't bother to show up for the trial. The jury listened to the testimony, reviewed the evidence, and sided firmly with the DiGiuros. The result was a staggering $63.3 million verdict, a record-setting judgment in Kentucky at the time. Ragland appealed the decision, claiming he was financially ruined and unable to pay such an amount. For the DiGiuro family, though, the civil verdict wasn't just about money. It was about making sure Ragland could never live comfortably, surrounded by privilege, without feeling the weight of what he'd done. Mike DiGiuro made it clear they wouldn't stop fighting, no matter how long it took. So, what's been going on with Ragland since then, you're wondering? Well, just a few months ago in June 2024, Ragland was arrested in Frankfurt, Kentucky, for assault and terroristic threatening, following a violent altercation with his mother and another woman. Authorities were called to the scene after Ragland allegedly ran over their legs with his motorized wheelchair and made threats of violence, including threats to kill. The victims provided video evidence of the attack, and police found visible signs of abuse. It's clear that Shane Ragland's journey through the criminal justice system is far from finished. 